Black Hill Energy, heating homes across County Armagh. Fill up your tank for a rainy day with County Armagh's fastest growing fuel company. For latest prices, visit our website at www.blackhillenergy.net or call us today on 02838 344 Black Hill Energy, Ansborough Industrial Park, Lurgan. Welcome once again to the Eye on the Ball. This is your host, Elaine Ingram. This week's guest needs no introduction. He was just an ordinary boy from Newry who grew up playing football with his brother and his friends down in the meadow. But he had an extraordinary talent, a talent that soon catapulted him to fame across the water in England and on the world stage for Northern Ireland. But he's never forgotten his roots and he's happy to talk to me about his life in Newry and everything that came afterwards. The man, of course, is one of the greatest goalkeepers the world has ever seen. Pat Jennings. Hello. Hello, Pat. Yep. Yeah. It's Elaine. Elaine, how are you? I'm great, how are you? Yep, fine, yep. Uh, first of all, I just want to say what an honour it is to, to get to speak to you. Really, thanks so much for taking this call. Um, I suppose I want to start at the beginning. Um, you began playing football um, for an under-19 team when you were only 11 years of age here in Newry. Yep. And I, I lived in the meadow. In the meadow. No, which is now Jennings Park, yep. And it was lovely to see, to see um, that you, you make a point of always saying that that's one of your favourite things is having Jennings Park named after you, which, you know, anybody who plays... Carmel League football will be delighted to hear that. Yeah, very good. Yeah, but sure, I'm back and forward to Ireland all the time. With it. Uh, I'm involved with the Irish FA McDonald's on the Grassroots Programme. So mm. I've been ambassador for them for the last 12, 13 years. So I'm in an idle Northern Ireland all the time. Uh, do I not go around the country acknowledging the people that do great work in grassroots football? So uh, I'm plus with golf out and something. I'm involved with Corporation Ireland for the last 30 years and uh, I've done all sorts for them and support of them along with the great Derek Dugan, you know, so uh, from from motorcycles, uh, that was fast, picking up 1,500 cyclists, cycling through to Dublin and picking up 1,500 and riding back the next day. We've done that a couple of times and motorcycles, uh, then I'd done a walk with Derek Durgan from the middle of Dublin to the middle of Belfast as well for Corporation Iron. So, so you're uh, keeping yourself very busy, yeah? Yeah, over the years, like, I mean, that's uh, 30, 35 years I've been involved with uh, Corporation Iron. I have a golf day, which I've missed this, uh, this year for the first time at Royal County Down. It was my 27th year. Unfortunately, because of the COVID thing, uh, we couldn't, couldn't hold it this year. Yeah, it's it's such a shame that, you know, things like, you know, sports have been so affected yeah. you know, and even stuff and travel. I suppose you can't travel. You're you're in London. No, I haven't been, believe it or not. I hadn't been back to Ireland from uh, from January. Uh, I came back to the Belfast Telegraph Awards, my wife, Eleanor and I. We haven't been back since. And I've got a lovely new house sitting up the road and Mike and uh, I haven't been near it, you know. Were you planning um, on, on, yeah, you, 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 you You've stuck to your roots all these years. I mean, having lived in England for so long and, you know, played for most of your career over there, you've always kept your connections here? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, all my family are still there, brothers and that. And uh, uh, I'm right the way through from, right the way through the, the, the troubles after my last match with a load of the car up and uh, the next day would have been over on the Liverpool like Hollyhead book back to Ireland for six or seven weeks, you know. And as you can imagine, in the one of those days, there wasn't much happening, there wasn't a lot you could do. Yeah. Uh, so it was golf, or, or, but it was nice just to get back to see the families, you know. Yeah. So, Have you always played golf? Uh, 
no, never played golf at all to I went to England. And uh, I, I, one night, one day, just to carry for a few of our senior players, Jimmy Greaves and Bill Brown and people they got, they were all golf fanatics. And uh, I couldn't believe watching the golf. I thought, where have I been? I've missed all these, these years. I was only probably uh, 18, 19 at the time. So I soon thinking home there to Ireland. I'd have been down to Green Ore and spend the days playing golf during the summers, you know. Yeah. So great times, great memories. So, yeah. You started off in forestry here in Newry. Uh, well, yeah, before that I even went to work. I mean, in those days, unless you're in education in Ireland, and then you you, uh, you just took any sort of a job to get a few bobs. You were lucky if you get any sort of work. And uh, I went to work in the local factory, Horrocks' factory on the Warren Point Road, just for down below where I live, Chapel Street. And uh, as I say, you took any sort of work to get a few bob, and I went to work in, the, in that factory, two pound eighteen a week. And you would have had a, a check in in the morning at eight o'clock, and, and check out at six o'clock at night for two pound eighteen. <laughs> so uh, that was a t- strange times, but um, unfortunately, that the the, uh, the factory closed after ten months. And uh, I was out of work then for a couple of weeks, and my dad was working for Haldan Fisher and on the uh, in a timber gang up the road, just literally across from, from where my house is on that mountain. And uh, he got me a job in the timber gang, so I was literally there. I think I, I was there for ten months, and I came in from. Uh, Worked one night, my brother Brian, who played me in that under 19 league in Uri for Shamrocks, he was playing with Uri United. And uh, he said to me that the goalkeeper was going to England to look for work. Why didn't I come down and do a bit of training? I might get a game. So. <laughs> Had you been in nets at all for. for... No, not at all. I never dreamt about uh, I played, obviously, uh, in that under 19 league when I was 11 yeah. at, in the Met, at the Meadow. I mean, all the different areas of the town picked the names of famous clubs, and we were Shamrocks, and there was Celtic, and Ballabot, and the Arsenal, and, and uh, with, it was, they were bringing, I mean, with some unbelievable eight, nine hundred people at the matches on the night. The rival was unbelievable in these games, but uh, that was where basically where it started, and the brother played in that team. And then he went on to uh, to play serious soccer, like myself. But I just carried on then after it. As an 11-year-old, there was no uh, real soccer in the time. Yeah. So I just played Gaelic football at school. I uh, played out, played midfield, didn't realise how beneficial that was going to be to me down the road whenever I started playing serious uh, soccer then. Do you but, think the Gaelic uh, helped a lot because of the yeah. ball handling? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you were getting knocked about, challenged with everybody else. Everybody going with a hand. So psychologically, I whenever I started playing serious soccer, then uh, the crosses were coming in, and people were trying to head it underneath you. And you've been used to dealing with people competing with you with a hand. So it was, you know, psychologically, it just made it so much easier for me. Yeah. So, uh, but at that time, I mean, I never dreamt about playing football. And then he went to. to Going back to uh, my brother, he was playing with Yuri United and uh, he came in one night and said to me, why don't you come down to a bit of training? And me coming out of the mountain and going to Yuri, down to Yuri to train and finish up in a cold shower at the end of the night. No thanks. <laughs> so uh, a couple of weeks or a week later, he was there again with the boys that run on the team. They had no one had played me on the 19 league and they said, get your fella to come down. So I went down on the Thursday night and got picked for the team on the Saturday and uh, kept a clean sheet and that was me up and running and three months later we'd won the Irish Junior Cup. And that's a big deal around here. <laughs> so that was, yeah, I think there's something like three on the teams or something. Like yeah, that. yeah. The Junior so Cup is, is, a, is, a, is a big one for, for yeah. here. But obviously that was a drop in the ocean for you at, at yeah. in later years. <laughs> But I mean, I never, even at that stage, never dreamt to play professional football. And then I went into the Uri Town team the next year. And I'm there about three months again. The chairman, 
uh, he came to me one night and said, Pat, we're putting you in forward for selection of the Irish youth team. Sam McCullough was chairman. And uh, I said, what does that mean? He said, well, there's trials coming up in Belfast. If you make the trials, make the Northern Ireland team. Uh, there's a European Youth Tournament coming up in England. And uh, there's a possibility you could qualify for that. We still had a player that started uh, to see who was going through to represent Ireland. So it was a year of the big snow in, across Britain and the trials in Belfast were cancelled because of bad weather. But I could pick the play for Northern Ireland. So now I'm going down to Dublin to play the, the game against the, the Republic and over the two games we finish up winning. So I'm now going through to play in this European Youth Tournament in England. In Wembley, um, no less. Well, that's where it finished up. I have to come off the mountain in the Timothy Canyon. And 10 days later, I'm playing in the world famous uh, Wembley. That and must have been something days, else. I played in the FA Cup final. I played uh, for your country. I mean, some great players in England played all their life in the first division, never got to play at Wembley. And here's me, 10 days in the game, and I'm playing at the world famous Wembley. So that must have that been really inspirational for you. Unbelievable, yeah. And who were your heroes in those days? Your sporting well, I heroes? A, a fellow in Uri, man, a fellow called Peter McParland. Oh, that's right, yeah. Who literally lived to a couple of hundred yards down the street from me. And uh, he was our local hero, you know. Played for the junior team as us, Shamrock Grovers. And then went on to play for the Aston Villa and the national team. And won the first, his, won, won his FA Cup with the... Uh, uh, Aston Villa in 1957 and then I done the same 10 years later yeah. in uh, 1967 won the first FA Cup with Spurs so, yeah yeah and then won again with Arsenal it's not Cup. often that you have um, you know Spurs and Arsenal fans both um, you know embracing you uh, you know it, it says a lot about you and your character you know, that, that you would be such a popular player having played for both of those teams? Well, I, I obviously done a decent job for both yeah. teams, yeah. <laughs> so that was the important thing, but having played nearly 600 or something, we got for Tottenham and then another 330 for Arsenal, so an unbelievable career, you know. 119 of the match was too short of 1,100 first last game, so yeah. it was just an unbelievable career, you know. And how did it feel after 13 years with Spurs when um, you were, when Keith Birkinshaw decided to sell you to Arsenal? How, how, how did that feel at the time? <laughs> Probably the worst day of my life in football. Yeah. Uh, somebody coming to you at that stage. I mean, I've been lucky in my career to be football a year twice. Yeah, and you were huge. I mean, you were a fantastic, still a fantastic player. I mean, there didn't seem to be any yeah. rhyme or reason for it, you know? In 1973, I was the Football Writers Player of the Year, 76, PFA Player of the Year. I'm the only goalkeeper in the country that have won both, and uh, even up to now. So uh, it was such a shock, 76 and Player of the Year. Yeah, Football you didn't see it coming year. at all, did you? And, no, but then I had 20, I missed 21 games the next year with Tottenham. Uh, had a bad injury, and at the end of the season, the team was relegated. And looking back, I think had I played in 10 or 12 of the match, they might have got enough points to keep topping them up. Yeah. But that's something we'll never know. Well. But I was back that literally the last month of that season. And uh, I picked the Sunday paper up one, one Sunday. And I'm reading that there's a possibility I might be available for transfer. So I couldn't believe it. Like, I mean, yeah. a couple of times earlier I'd asked. Bill Nicholson, never. he was manager of Barcelona, come in and showing an interest in me. And uh, I'd gone in and asked him. My contract was up as well, so it was just a, a means. I knew there was no ever any chance of me getting away from Tottenham at that stage with Bill Nicholson. Yeah. So I went in and sort of said, I've had an inquiry from Barcelona. So he just said to me, you're joking, son, what are we going to do? So that was the way it was in the old days, you know. So... Yeah. Uh, then, whenever it appeared in the paper that there was a possibility that I might be available, uh, Terry Neal, who was the manager at Arsenal, he rang me up and he said, Pat, what's this I'm saying? I'm reading in the paper that you might be available. I said, uh, yeah, 
I, I said the voice you heard of it as well. <laughs> yeah, but I said, I can't believe that uh, it's going to happen. And I said, plus the fact <laughs> there's no way I can join Arsenal. You know, being caught into Arsenal, it just couldn't yeah. happen. But, so, uh, but that was all, that was the last month of that season. And, and then I went, I asked Keith Bergenshaw, we're actually on tour the last uh, month last couple of weeks of the season we went to Norway and on the way back I thought I'd just ask Keith Burke and Joe what the situation is uh, so as, as usually I'm going off to Ireland for six seven, seven weeks uh, I want to know what, what's happening whenever I come back next year never dreamt that I was going to be available and I'm going to be sold Yeah. so whenever I asked him what's, what I'm reading in the paper here he said well he said Bobby Robson from Ipswich was in the at Easter but he said it was worth more than what his job was worth at that time to let me go. So I knew from that minute on that the writing was on the wall. So he obviously thought about it. So you can I... imagine what sort of a six or seven weeks I had in Ireland on holiday. Oh, yeah. Thinking, what am I coming back to next year? Where am I going to be? You know, the family uh, up the country, a new house, uh, kids into new schools. So, I mean, that's football, really. And it's happening with all the players that every other week up and down the country, that's football. But I was one of the lucky ones that never had it right away through my career, been in the same area more or less for, uh, for all my career. So, but, uh, then I, I, I went back anyway and I started playing in all the pre-season games for Tottenham. And I'm thinking he's obviously changed his mind. He's going to offer me a new contract. My contract was up. And he came to me one morning night in the training ground at 11 o'clock and said, can I board me at that? And I thought he wanted to talk tactics. Yeah. So the next thing he hits me with, now that we've decided that you can go, don't want to take you to Sweden tomorrow. The team will go on to Sweden last week of pre-season. It'll be an embarrassment to the other goalkeeper. So that was what he hit me with. So I said, you want me to apologize? been a good player all these years. <laughs> so the next thing he said, Right, he said, Bobby Robson's ringing you uh, tonight at six o'clock. And I'll, I'm ringing you at half six. I want to know where you're going before I go to Sweden tomorrow. So I said, I've been at Tottenham 13 years and you, you're expecting to make a decision for you to suit you in a half an hour. So <laughs> that was what the conversation finished up. And then, of course, I finished up saying to him, uh, by the way, what sort of money are you asking for me? Transfer money. So he said, why, what do you think you're worth? So I said, well, I know what I'm worth, but I don't think Tottenham should be getting it. <laughs> I've been here 13 years, and usually players may be done six, seven, eight, ten years at the club, bought for 100,000. They were given free transfers. And I bought for 27,000 13 years earlier, and now I'm being sold. So that, that hurt me a lot as well. I mean, I was sold for, for 45, 50,000. And in those days, you won't do anything out of the money, out of the transfer money. So You're just a commodity, aren't you? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. I mean, and that's the same for footballers now, all the time. It, it's, it's Yeah, that's what I said earlier. Once they, the club wants you to go, it doesn't matter what you think. Are, are, and it's happening to players every week, every other week. Uh, you know, you, they come along and say, right, we, we want to sell you. We don't think you're good enough. We're getting a repla- replacement in. And it doesn't matter what you're thinking, you just got to go work wherever the job takes you. Yeah, and so people have, you've got your life set up, you know, yep. in area. I mean, you you say you were lucky because you stayed in London, but I mean, yeah, as you said, like that doesn't happen to players up and down the country all the time. Yeah. You're yep. only as good as your last game. And even, even in your case, it was nothing to do with your game. It was just, you know, whatever they just decided. Well, look, believe it or not, I read Ben Nicholson's book there, the late great Ben Nicholson there about, uh, through the lockdown, I've been reading books, catching up, and I read his book there about five or six months ago. And in the book, he said one of the, the reasons I was sold was that there was new legislation coming out through the PFA, Professional Football Association, that if you've spent five, six years previously at a club and come to my age, 32, 33, you could walk away on a free transfer. So, that was he was saying that was what he put it down to the reason that was sold because well, they could have told you that at the time they got me forty five fifty thousand from me that 
that they couldn't have got there yeah. the next year, you know. But you're that football, as you said earlier there, that we had football up with clubs up with you. You were very young now, You were because you were only 17 when you went over there, when you went over to Watford um, yeah. from Newry Town. And what what is that like for, I mean, people don't seem to realise, like, how well are you looked after back in those days? You know, are you just you're away from your family? You're just well, lumped I, I, over I, in a new place. Yeah, as you say, Elaine, I've never been away from uh, out of Ireland. I've never been any further south than Dublin. I, I went to play basketball with Derry and down in Derry for the school, and uh, that was I'd never been out of Ireland at seventeen. So even that was massive for me, you know. And uh, but I mean. I was earning on the mountain four pounds something a week, and my first contract at Watford was twenty three pound a week. Another two pound of them made the first team plus bonuses. And I mean, to be honest, I thought I'd won the pool. Yeah. You know. <laughs> but still, you must have been lonely. You were still on your own, you know. Yeah, but that sort of money for playing football, I couldn't believe my luck. I would have played football for nothing. Yeah. So that was it. And I was lucky because it was only there was only a month of the season left at that stage whenever I joined. Uh, because of the bad where it had to be extended that year. So I joined and Watford had four games to go at the end of that season and they were in danger of being relegated from the third to the fourth division. And they didn't play me the first two games. They got themselves a relegation ball and then I played the last two matches. So uh, then after that I had uh, five or six weeks in Ireland, holidays again. So it was a nice little break. I'd been overseen when I was going back to. And uh, it, as I said, it, it was lovely the way it worked out. And then I had a manager at, at uh, Watford, a fellow called Bill McGarry. He was a really tough manager, but three or four times during my one season, but on that first season, on a Friday, he came with an air ticket and said to me, Pat, uh, there you go, son. Uh, tomorrow night after the match, we'll have you dropped it at the airport and we'll pick you up again Thursday night. Oh, that's so nice. that meant so much to me at the time, just getting back to see the family. Yeah. And as I say, that happened three or four times during that, that first season. Oh, that was good that you were looked yeah. after in that yeah. sense. Because, yeah, it's a, it is a tough thing to be away from home with all that pressure as well. Yeah. And but, I mean, in those days, you didn't, I didn't realize what pressure was about. I suppose you, know? you didn't. It's, yeah, you were just and a kid. Just it's going, an adventure. Yeah. People were putting on the next rung of the ladder and you were just going along with it. So, and in those days, with no goalkeeping coaches as such, so you just had to learn through your mistakes, you know. That was that. Well, you have was. such an unorthodox style. I don't know, could anybody teach the way you go? I mean... I was looking at some of your videos there from footage and it's just incredible. The saves that you have made over the years are just, they just defy any sort of logic. Um, you just fling yourself all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> can that, can you actually, can you teach that? I know you do coaching and everything. Can you teach that or is it just innate? Is it just something well, that you have? I mean, you look at goalkeepers and there's not two of us the same, you know. So that's just something that you develop in the, in the game, but... Uh, what we'll work on now would be would just be handling balls from all angles, all all distances, uh, round the goal, all sorts of you know, ninety percent of the game. Whenever I was eventually had goalkeeping coach, my first coach was was Bob Wilson, who I played against every year, Tottenham Arsenal matches. So I spent uh, thirteen months at Watford, no coach. Uh, thirteen years at Tottenham, no coach. And then all of a sudden I've got Bob Wilson. Right. And I just literally would have been two hours a week with him. But that was so beneficial. I really enjoyed working with him. So then it was something that I brought on into coaching whenever I finished uh, playing at Tottenham and Arsenal. But nowadays, I mean, half the training is <laughs> can, the, can the goalkeepers control it and pass it out? They all want to play like our two players now, you know? Yeah, you know, I noticed that, yeah. Yeah. In our day, it was the best place to defend was in the opposing eighteen yard box. So that's how much the game has changed. I mean, and I, I mean, you, you just look at the pitches that we played on uh, to what they play on nowadays. I mean, the pitches you just can't compare what we played on to what the, the present day pitches are. Uh, absolutely immaculate. You wouldn't get a bad bounce. 
you know, and hard day you didn't know where it was going. When it bounced in front of you, come up and hit you in the mouth, that was day down. And that was, and we had the gloves were just plain cotton gloves and next to useless, but better. And the cotton. boots are probably just much more well, bog standard. Yeah. <laughs> and the balls were much heavier in those days uh, than what they are nowadays. So it was just changed so, so completely. Does it make it better, up. or do you think, you know? No, I think it's, it's brilliant. I'd love to be starting again, you know. Really, yeah. But uh, even even the, when you look at the, the substitute situation nowadays, I mean, in our days, you would have never you never got substitute in this. There was no substitutes in the early days, and now you've got such a squad of players, three or four or five substitutes, and if you get any little injury at all, or even if you're having a bad day, you get you can get sub now. Even the subs are coming on, but if the injury time time goes up three or four minutes injury time, and somebody's getting felt, and that goes down in the pain shot. Yeah. Same, same the international teams now. So, but uh, that's just the way the game's moved on. I suppose everything just develops. Yeah, yeah. And what about your international career now? I mean, you began, um, well, you're the most capped player for, for Northern Ireland. Um, which is an incredible achievement. Um, and your very first game was with well, them. I, I, I lost that just recently. Oh, did Steve you? Davis, he, yeah, Stephen Davis. He got his uh, 120th cap there. Oh, and you 119? A couple of games ago, yeah. yeah. Oh, well. I say there were different times whenever we were. I think I played 118 of my 119 appearance. played 119 then, so. I think I was sub maybe twice, uh, once injury. And just before the World Cup in 82, I had another bad injury and I right through from qualifying in November, December. Uh, I got injured in January and then I was every six, seven weeks going out, breaking down, having taken from 1964, joining the international team to now 82. I'm going to miss out on the World Cup. Oh dear, yeah. So, after trying for so long to, to, yeah. to get there. And uh, I literally played half a game against Wales in May. And whenever I came in at half time, Billy Bingham said to me, right, Pat, that'll do you. You've got a month now to get fit for Spain. That was one of the half a games that I missed, you know. And but, uh, the, uh, the, the best Spain thing that I ever know. happened then, because um, beating the hosts. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that must have been something else. Yeah, unbelievable, mate. No, they were unbelievable just to, to, to make that there. Uh, we've been compared all the time, every four years. Uh, the last team that had qualified in Northern Ireland was 1958. Mm-hmm. And the great Peter McPowell played in that team. Yeah. So it was something that was all, was all, are they ever going to qualify again? So that was from me joining the international team at 17, 18 to 36 now. And I thought, I was never had to pass me by, I weren't going to make it. So it was brilliant. And then I'm thinking, and then it was like buses. Was going to make it. It yep. four, four years later, you were there again. Yeah. Well, it was incredible the way that worked out. I mean, I had finished uh, my last contract at Arsenal, finished in '85. And I was again home in Ireland, seven, eight weeks home with all the family finished. And uh, I got a call then from. The Tottenham manager Peter Shreves had can you help us out? Uh, we've only got one fit goalkeeper, and that was uh, Ray Clemens, the great Ray Clemens, who unfortunately we lost, died there a few weeks back. Okay. He was the only fit goalkeeper that Tottenham had. Could I please come back and help out at Tottenham? So I said to Peter Shreves, Peter, I'm finished. I haven't kicked the ball for eight weeks now. So, uh, and funny enough, uh, Larry McManamy, he had asked me to go to Sunderland. Well, he was taking over as manager of Sunderland and asked me where to go with him to Sunderland. I thought, Tottenham Arsenal all these years, so thanks, but no thanks. You know, it meant moving house, moving family again. Yeah. So uh, he had rang Billy Bingham, I think, and Billy Bingham had said, like a Pats fan in any team, I'll pick him for these qualifying matches for the World Cup, you know. So uh, 
I knew if I was playing I love I never even dreamt at that stage that I thought it was out that was it but uh, I stayed with Peter Shreves just to keep them happy Peter I'll be back in London at the weekend Friday, Saturday I'll give you a ring whenever I get back and the next thing he said Pat Monique we've got a reserve match against Chelsea on Tuesday this was Sunday night he said I need you to play in that match he said I'm booking you in a flight in the morning so I literally went back on the Monday and played against Chelsea on the Tuesday, kept a clean sheet. And that was me back at Tottenham. Yeah. And then I played uh, literally all that year, just reserve matches. Keep yourself right. I played, played one Super Cup match against Liverpool. But just played reserve team football and uh, kept playing in the qualifying matches for the World Cup. We had two games against Turkey, uh, clean sheets. We played the great uh, French team, Latini's team in France. Wow. And a friend, they went out there and we kept the clean sheet. We played another game against uh, Spain in Spain, kept the clean sheet. One of the other, Romania was the, the second last qualifying match for the World Cup. Somehow we went to Romania and beat them one day. And then that took us through to the last match against England at Wembley to get a point to qualify for the World Cup. So again, went out there in the night, somehow we managed to keep a clean sheet that night and, uh, and qualified for the World Cup Mexico. Yeah. So there were just unbelievable times, like, you know. But, uh, and then, I mean, from my point of view, to finish up playing against uh, Brazil. Brazil. You couldn't get better than that. You couldn't finish your career. And you were the oldest the player in that tournament too, weren't you? 41st birthday against yeah. Brazil, yeah. So they were great, great, unbelievable times, yeah. Couldn't and what was it like playing have, against Brazil? Couldn't have written the script for that. <laughs> well, we got, I think we got beat three on yeah, the night. Yeah, three nil on the night. But, yeah. but I mean, did, just the occasion itself must have been amazing. Well, everybody admired the way Brazil played football. So, I mean, it was just... It was oh, a, yeah, well, they a, are the yeah. um, the beautiful game comes from Brazil, doesn't it, really? Yeah, yeah. Fantastic times. And, uh, it was just brilliant. We were lucky to get nil on the night, but anyway... <laughs> And then after that match, believe it or not, I got uh, I got chosen to play in, a, in the rest of a world team. Are you and you played against um, you played yeah. with Maradona. No, late... against Maradona. You played, played against Maradona. Ameri- he played in the Americas. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, not only did I get picked to play, but I, I captained the rest of the world team, which was, you know, what a dream that was. Like. Well, that must be a dream when you're up against Maradona. Uh, yeah, in itself. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, the other team, they, they had an incredible team. I only played the first half in the match. And then uh, the, the other uh, Russian goal, Defi, he came on the second half. And we were 2-0 up whenever I went off at half time. So and, you didn't uh, concede any goals? No, no. <laughs> and uh, the, the goalkeeper was much busier the second half. Uh, and the, the rest of the, the no, Europe, America's got it back to two each. Maradona, I think, scored the second goal against us, and then there was a penalty shootout, and Maradona scored the winning penalty. Were and you in nets then? No. You no. weren't in for the penalty yeah. shootout? Thankfully not. Thankfully not, not. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> even to watch him, it must have been a... Unbelievable uh, memories, yeah. Yeah. What a great player, yeah. Brilliant. Yeah, he was a fantastic player. You scored a goal yourself, actually. Against Man United in the Charity Shield in 1967, I believe. Yep, yep. <laughs> Explain that. Uh, well, again, I mean, it was, uh, it was uh, in those days, we won the cup. Um, you, had a, you had a go to the league winners, which was Man United at Old Trafford. So uh, it was a free kick, literally, just outside our box. Dave McKay was in his going up to take it. I said, give it to me, Dave, I'll knock it up. And I was trying to basically hit our stand up forward, Alan Gildine. And Alex Stepney, the Man United goalkeeper, he had obviously thought that they won't be able to control the ball that's travelling the length of the pitch. And he came out the back of his centre half and Alan Gildine. And my, my clearance has, has missed both of them. <laughs> and the next bounce, poor old Alex, now no man's land. <laughs> and uh, once the second bounce is in the back of the net, and everybody, including me, is thinking, uh, what did he give the, the ref? Uh, Kenneth Wilson, though, he was lucky enough it wasn't television. And 
he was commentating that day on the match and it took him about 30 seconds to, to work out that Jennings had scored a goal. <laughs> Has that ever happened you before know? in a, in a you know, uh, no, professional I think game? Maybe, no, not in my time anyway. Yeah. But uh, it's happened quite a, I think, quite a few times since, you know. Yeah. But uh, when you consider the balls were much heavier in our day and that, uh, I'm surprised it's not happened a bit more often than that. It's not much I suppose your GAA in came into play there as well. <laughs> <laughs> no, but great memories, you know. And your first ever international um, match, you, yeah, your debut, was with um, the the late, great George Best. And he was a yeah. good friend of yours, yeah? Yeah, brilliant. I mean, I was still at, still at Watford and uh, he was just coming into the Man United team. And so we hadn't come up against each other, I hadn't played against them. And uh, we are both picked the same night, as you say, for the international team. Uh, Northern Ireland had just been beaten, I think, 8-3 at Wembley. And the great Harry Gregg was in goal. And looking back, I've often thought what Harry Gregg must have thought about me coming into the team, an 18-year-old playing for Watford, hmm. taking the great Harry Gregg's place. That was the way it was. I think there was a selection committee in those days that picked the team. But uh, I wasn't complaining anyway at that stage. Like, But though George and myself had said I'd never come up against him in a match, but not the only great memories of George. And the way he played games and played one match, matches of remember against the great uh, Celtic had just won the, the Euro- uh, European Cup and we played uh, Scotland in Windsor Park. And there was three or four of those players, great players in that in that uh, Scotland team. And George that day was just walking past them as if they weren't there. We beat them one nil. So that was one of the great memories of George. And then even towards the end, whenever uh, he went to Fulham, people, the, the press especially, were questioning whether he was good enough to come back and play at international level. And we were drawn against the great Dutch team. Neeskins, Rep, Van de Kerk, Christ, all that team. Yeah. And it was a, the away match was in Rotterdam. And George went out that night. They took Neeskins back to do a man from my marking job on him. And he must have not made Neeskins about four or five times that night. <laughs> now Neeskins is trying to kick him and he's got a boat. Neeskins and come down on top of him. And Neeskins is lying on the floor. George takes his tie up. Up and stays here, tying them together with his legs. <laughs> so, Those but, were the days. <laughs> yeah, we, we drew with that with, uh, with that great Dutch team two each that night, and uh, that was a great Dutch team that went on to play Argentina in the final of the World Cup the next year. So that was how good they were, and what a performance we had to uh, to draw with them that night. But George never actually played in the World Cup himself, which is a shame. No, looking back, I mean... His international career was, was quite like, you know, he didn't... Um, yeah, he only played 37, 38 times. Yeah. But, uh, and that's my one regret for him, that he didn't, such an unbelievable player, that he didn't make the World Cup squad. He wouldn't have been, he would have been too old for the 86. Yeah. But uh, I think Billy Bingham did look on him for the 82 squad and decided that maybe he wasn't there. Uh, wasn't up to them. But I think even to brought him on for a second half or something like that, there's no way he would have let you down. Go, you know? Yeah, no, he had a magic, he was magic, yeah, so he, he could produce miracles, you know, at times on the yeah. field. Um, you, you wrote a, an autobiography there, um, but it was quite a number of years ago. It was when you were coming to the end of your um, Arsenal career. Well, I thought it was, uh, it was the end of my career. Yeah. At, at uh, 82, and Having joined Watford in 62, 63, I thought I'll leave it as long as I have can and, and then I'll have something to write about, you know. <laughs> People write books now every other three or four years, they write new books, but I thought I'll have something to write about and it was a good book, but then the next four years, from 82 to 86, was just incredible again, all the happening. You could have written and, another book. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, have you changed in any of your opinions that you had? And I know you said in it you were talking about him. An All Ireland team was one th- was one thought you had. Have you still got any opinions on something like that? Well, no. I was 
after about that, like, but uh, I mean, I work, I work for the Irish FA. I stayed early in McDonald's in the grassroots program, yeah. so, and I've got a Pat Jennings uh, suite in the new National Stadium. So, yeah. But I mean, there's no doubt. I mean, it will have stayed in the book if you had a bigger squad that uh, picked from. But uh, you would have obviously much better chance of having a better team, uh, you know. But uh, I don't know what the politics are or why the two teams have ever split up on the first team. But that's yeah. the way it is for both associations at the minute. So we just got to get on with it. Yeah. And what about the Guitar World Cup now? What do you think? That's, do you think it's a, it was a good? It's a good thing that they're having it there, or what are well, your thoughts? I can't believe that they would pick a venue like that. I mean, I know. Yeah, I think a lot of people would agree with you. Yeah, no matter what they do, they're not going to be able to to get away from that. Yeah, yeah. You know, but, they're uh, they're talking about air conditioning and all sorts of stuff, but I mean, realistically, it seems like it's going to be torturous for an awful lot of. Yeah, it'll be inter- it'll be interesting to see how it works out. Yeah. Yeah. And what about Northern Ireland um, now? I mean, there's a few. The goalkeepers that uh, we have in the north, I think they haven't the developed the the team down. They've done really well for us, you know. But it's just, uh, it's getting up. The other countries I you play against, uh, they're all good players, very professional out there, so that's what they're up against. And uh, instead, it took us all of those years from, from 58 qualifying right through to 82. So really, not a lot's changed, you know. Yeah, it's... But, uh, that's the way we are, so we've just got to get on with it. I mean, uh, both international teams north and south have done brilliant in that time like what they've qualified for so uh, and the support we get on both sides has been brilliant as well so that, that's a good thing and I mean they've just introduced there last year uh, I'm an ambassador for the United Union Champions Cup so last year we had uh, the winners of the, the, the north which was Linfield playing the winners of the south league and that was in dark. Yeah. So uh, I went to, to uh, went over for both matches for that and presented the cup in the end, you know. So they were great memories, good, good nights, you know. And your son, your son has played as well. He's uh, followed in, in, in your footsteps as a goalkeeper. Yeah, Pat. Patrick, yeah. 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 He's got, he's he's played for League of so. Ireland. Yeah, and Pat. Yeah. So he's it's come full circle. There, but he's, he's had a career, yeah, from uh, right the way through from, from Derry. Goalkeeper as well, following Dad. I know, yeah. So yeah. did you I teach him he yourself? Can ride, he can ride and catch the cross. And people would say, your dad would have caught that with one hand. That was what he was up against. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. He's got a lot of, uh, he's got big shoes to fill or big hands to fill, should, they, should I say? Yeah. <laughs> Have you got any plans to come back anytime soon? You know, now that yeah, things are starting to lift a bit. I went back to Tottenham and, and uh, as a player in, in '86, and then the next five or six years, I, I uh, hosted a box at Tottenham for a couple of friends of mine. And then '92, '93, Ozzy Ardila, to my pal Ozzy, he took over as manager, and he invited me back then to be first team goalkeeping coach. So I went back with him, supposedly a day a week, and then I finished up three, four days a week with the goal, working with the goalkeepers. And uh, then from from the first team goalkeeping coach, I'm now, well, for the last, I think, I don't know, 10 or 12, 14, 15 years, I've been working with the academy boys. Yeah. So at the minute, I'm still in a couple of days working with the academy boys. I'm doing more talking now than serving, but... Uh, this task now and make experience as much as I can. Yeah. So, uh, no, that's it at the minute. So, and I do, as I said earlier, ambassador for the Irish FA and McDonald's and the Grassroots program. So, I would have been in now 10 or 12 times already into Ireland by this time. Can round the country acknowledging all the people that do fantastic work in Grassroots football. And, uh, 
the summer festivals at McDonald's and the FA ran, you know, great, great occasion and uh, good time. So, unfortunately, we're hoping to get them. Well, unfortunately, it didn't happen this year, but yeah. hopefully next year we'll get them back on again. Yeah, and that's what you need is to have all this stuff coming through because grassroots is where it all begins, doesn't it? And you know you know that well yourself. Yeah. Um, and I mean, even now, as I said earlier, the, the worked for, for uh, Corporation Ireland and this year I had a come from the 27th year of uh, golf at Royal County Down. So uh, that was a, a, a blow. There was about 10 or 12 t- teams come in here from the UK to play in it every year. Yeah. With, with playing the Sunday at our glass and then go on to Newcastle and, and play it at Royal County Town on, on the Monday. So there were great times, you can imagine, 30, 30, 35 teams uh, playing in that every year. Yeah, I'd say so, that's fantastic. But hopefully really, it'll be back really next missed, year. Really missed that, you know. Yeah. And, uh, and Peyton as well for the Northern Ireland Golf Tournament at Glen Gorm every year, Dalamina. So, uh, yeah, that, I've had a go as well this year. So, so you're really missing it? Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Missing the trips home, yeah. Yeah. Well, hopefully so, next year will be different. and we'll, Yeah, hopefully we'll get back to uh, some sort of normality next year, you know. And we'd love to see you out down in Jennings Park. Well, I was there last year with McDonald's, uh, doing a little promotion for McDonald's there last year. It was photographed again. Uh, along the sign Jennings Park which is lovely you know yeah and I had a makeover there a few years ago as well and the um, a, a bit of a makeover but we still need 3G pitches that's what we need <laughs> yeah well at least uh, then you can well it's brilliant what they've done uh, right across Northern Ireland and the 3G pitches you know yeah we need some uh, in your you can play all, all you know all ours and you don't do any damage to the pitches like the right day yeah you can imagine the weather we're getting at the moment being Nothing, only rain, rain, and uh, you just couldn't play on the pitches. Then, couldn't use them. Well, you probably could have years ago when you were playing. Nobody cared then. You would play in in any conditions on on any pitches on any surfaces. Yeah, but again, whenever you look at the facilities I have now and uh, the floodlight facilities, and it's just great for the kids to be able to have that facility. Wine. Yeah. So many places now in in Northern Ireland. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, listen. It's been really has been a, a, a privilege and an honour speaking to you, Pat. And no, um, no problem. And I hope to see you over this side of the water, um, sooner rather than later. Yeah, yeah. Looking forward to getting back. Yeah, seeing all the mates again. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well. Family. Yeah. Thanks very much, Pat. Right. No it's been problem. lovely talking to you. Right. Right. Good luck. Thanks. Bye. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The Eye on the Ball. If so, subscribe to our podcast and to Arma Eye. If you've any suggestions about what you'd like to hear or any comments at all, feel free to send us a message or leave a comment. And I hope you'll join me next time for The Eye on the Ball. Black Hill Energy, heating homes across County Armagh. Fill up your tank for a rainy day with County Armagh's fastest growing fuel company. For latest prices, visit our website at www.blackhillenergy.net or call us today on 02838 344 223. Black Hill Energy, Ansborough Industrial Park, Lurgan.